So we have about a minute left. So I'm uh, admitting everyone. We can start. Oh, sure. Hello, everyone. We'll just uh, start in a few minutes. Sure. My suggestion is wait for a minute or two after six and then start. Yeah, sure. Sir. Okay, sir, I think we'll start. Okay. Uh, good evening, all, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Akshay. I'm the uh, project director for Mandalay Foundation, and I'm delighted once again to welcome you all for an important RTA session. Before we start, for those of you uh, who are new, the uh, webinar is being organized by Mandalay Foundation. We are a 12 year old non profit organization, primarily engaged in spreading financial literacy and advocacy for savers. We also make efforts to spread consumer awareness on various issues that are of interest to our members. Over the years, we have organized many sessions and workshops explaining the provisions of the RTI Act and have also done sessions on how to effectively file applications to seek information. We have also made efforts to provide counseling and assistance on RTI applications through our RTI Advice app, which is available to download on both Google and Apple app stores. A uh, link to download the app will be shared later in the chat. Uh, today's session uh, will be a refresher for some, while it also may be a fresh learning experience for others. As we ask uh, once again, Mr. Uh, former Central Information Commissioner, Mr. Shailesh Gandhi, to enlighten us on an important sections of the RTI Act. Many of you are already aware of who Mr. Gandhi is, but allow me to formally introduce him. Uh, as I've said, Mr. Gandhi is a formal Central Information Commissioner and is also the first RTI activist to become an Information Commissioner. He served at the commission for three years and nine months, uh, during which he disposed of nearly 20,000 cases and also managed to completely digitize his office. After retirement from the commission, Mr. Gandhi continues to remain active in all matters related to RTI and dedicates his time to helping citizens learn more about the act. He is also present as an expert on our RTI advice app, where he takes the time to answer your queries on specific RTI applications. Before I hand it over to Mr. Gandhi, allow me to share some ground rules for today's session. We have kept all of you on mute for the benefit of all involved and will un uh, unmute you only during the Q&A session. For optimal viewing, we suggest that you keep your webinar on speaker view. This meeting is being recorded and shall be uploaded to our YouTube channel, Money Life TV. During the Q&A session, please use the raise hands button available on Zoom if you wish to ask any questions. Also, a sincere request to please keep your questions limited to under 90 seconds. Please feel free to use the chat section to share your comments, questions, and observations, but only send it in the public forum marked to everyone. Please do not send us a private message as we would not be able to monitor or reply to you while the session is live. Also, please note that your cameras may be on by default and you could be broadcasting your background and homes for everyone to see. If you wish to maintain your privacy, please do turn off your cameras now. And now without taking any more of your time, uh, may I request Gandhi sir to please take over. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Akshay. 
fellow citizens of India, thank you for joining this session today. And we are going to travel this journey of right to information, which is a very fundamental right available to citizens and which has been known to us only in the late 17 to 8, 20 years. The whole nation has started understanding what right to information is and more citizen involvement will take it to greater heights. When is the, what is the logic and the basis for the right to information? We say India is the world's largest democracy. I was taught in school that democracy means rule of the people, for the people, by the people. Do we really feel like rulers of this nation when we interact with government offices? The answer across the nation is no, we don't feel like rulers. Then how are we a democracy at all? Are we a sham democracy? We call ourselves a democracy largely because we have a reasonably fair system of elections by which we are able to choose our leaders, governments, change them, etc. And it's a reasonably fair system that operates. I would submit to you that having a fair system of elections and a constitution are necessary conditions for a democracy but are not the complete set of conditions. The heart and essence of democracy is the concept that each individual citizen is a sovereign in her own right and she gives a part of the sovereignty to the state in return for which she gets the rule of law. Sovereignty of the individual citizen is the key to democracy, is the heart of democracy. Without that, democracy doesn't exist. The whole concept of human rights stems from this. Respecting a human being because he or she is a human being, irrespective of whether he's educated, literate, illiterate, wealthy, non-wealthy, it doesn't matter. All of us have equal rights and equal divinity in us and equal sovereignty. At one lecture, when I was talking like this, uh, it was a live lecture, one of the students got up and said, Sir, are you serious? I said, Yes, we call this Lok Shahi. Lok Shahi can only have one meaning Logo ki Shahin Shahi. You, friend, should feel like a Bacha or a Begum when you deal with the government. He said, sir, baate to badi chikni chupadi aap kar rahe hai, aise kahi hota hai kya? Can it happen anywhere? I'd like to quote two examples to you of this. The first example I'd quote to you is of the United States of America. I'm not saying everything there is perfect, but they have a two century lead in terms of democracy over us. An immigrant from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, wherever, who has applied for citizenship of United States or green card which gives him the permission to do a job there. He or she will easily pick up the phone to ask the office about the status of his application, whether it's okay, whether there are any defects, when is it likely to be considered, so on and so forth. And 99% will get a perfectly rational answer to the phone call. You are all first-rate citizens of India. If you applied for change of address in your ration card and you call the rationing office, your chances of getting a response are almost nil. That is what democracy is all about. Respect for the individual citizen. One more example, I'd like to tell you a story that all of you are aware of, but I'd like to show it with a slightly different perspective. Both as Karmachan Gandhi got inside the train in South Africa about 125 years back. He had a first class ticket, but there was a white man sitting there who objected, and therefore, both the country Gandhi was taken off the train. The same story is written that Mohandas Karamchi Gandhi complained about what had happened to him by telegram 125 years back. And in about 12 to 14 hours, a railway official came and put him on the next train. Think of the significance of this. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was not a citizen of South Africa. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was not even a first-rate human being by South African law. He was a second-rate human being as the law existed then since he was not a white man. Despite that, he files a complaint by telegram and the system responds. Imagine you are filing a complaint with the Indian Railways in 2022 and how long it will take you to get any response about it. This is the heart and essence of democracy, my friends. Citizens own the government, own the nation. 
It's not just taxpayers. All of us as human beings, all of us as citizens own the nation. And one lecture again, one young man got up and said, sir, are you serious? You are joking. I said, I'm not joking. I'm serious about it. He said, supposing I like a government car, can I take it home? I said, you can't take it home. So he said, sir, I'm Jude Bol Rete. If I own the government, the car belongs to me. Why can't I take it home? The reason why he couldn't take it home is because he is in partnership with 140 crore other Indians, which I explained to him. But, and this is the key I would like to press. All the information on the files, computers, cupboards in the government also belongs to all of us, each one of us individually. And if that information is given to us, it does not deprive anybody else of the information because it can be shared with 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people. This is a philosophical base for the right to information, which is recognition that citizens own the government, actually own the government, actual recognition of that. So when we talk of the right to information, always remember this. Small historical background, the first such law recognizing citizens' right to access information from the government came about in Sweden on 2nd December 1776, 250 years back. After that, for nearly 150 years, sorry, I saw some message on audio. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you're fine. Yes, sir. Fine. 150 years back after that, no country passed such a law. In the last century, over 130 countries have now passed such laws. They go by three different names. Freedom of Information, FOI, Access to Information, ATI, and Right to Information, RTI, which is what we call it in India. They are similar concepts, recognizing the citizens' right to all information by the government. What information can be given to our citizens? The law doesn't say this. It says default mode is all information belongs to citizens. Only some exemptions are there, which are specifically spelled out. Apart from that, all the information should be given. And the information that is not given is not given because it is believed that certain interests need to be protected from harm. And we'll deal with that. Now, what we are going to do this evening, my friends, is go through the provisions, some of the key provisions of the RTI Act. Briefly, I will touch on how using wrong, illegal means, people deny information and how the arguments that you can use to access information. And a plea to all of you, start believing that you are the Bachas and Begums of this nation. You are the kings and queens of this nation. If you start believing that, your authority will spring automatically. Your duties will also come to you automatically. Let's start with the presentation, my friends. I'm going to share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll make it full screen. In India, the first movement for right to information started in rural Rajasthan. It was started by three unique people. Aruna Roy, a young IAS officer who resigned from her job to work with villagers and democracy. Nikhil Day, a young lawyer about 20 years junior to her, who had done his law in the United States and decided to join Aruna. And Shankar Singh, somebody who belonged to the village in which they worked. They got together, started discussing democracy with people. And out of that, through the concept, it was a homegrown concept, though it was existed before, but people started believing and acting as if they owned the information and started accessing information. In 2005, this got codified. The right to information is a basic 
fundamental right of citizens under Article 19.1a as approved by the Supreme Court in the Katrina of Judgments. However, it was not codified. This codification was done by the 2005 Act, which came into effect on 12th October 2005, which incidentally was Vijaya Dashmi. Let's take a look together, friends. Let's look at the preamble. The preamble of a law specifies what is its objective, what is expected to be. Just a minute. I... Yeah. Whereas the Constitution of India has established democratic republic. And whereas democracy requires an informed citizenry and transparency of information, which are vital to its functioning, but also to contain corruption and to hold governments in their instrumentalities accountable to the government. And whereas revelation of information in actual practice is likely to conflict with other public interests, including efficient operations of the government's optimum use of limited fiscal resources and the preservation of confidentiality of sensitive information. And whereas it is necessary to harmonize these conflicting interests while preserving the paramountcy of the democratic ideal. These conflicting interests were harmonized by the law, which has been very well drafted since it was partly evolved out of a negotiation with civil society. The harmonization has been done by the law. No further harmonization is required to be done by any adjudicators. And it is one of the best transparency laws in the world, in my opinion. But in actual implementation, we are not doing as well as we should. What is information? We are talking of right to information. Information means any material in any form, including records, documents, etc., etc. And information relating to any private body which can be accessed by a public authority under any other law for the time being in force. In simple terms, if I may put the first part of the provision, information must exist as a contract, as logbook, as orders, as opinions, as advices, it must exist. What exists is information, what doesn't exist is not information. I've seen people using RTI for years and not clearly understanding what is information. Let me try and explain this. For example, if you ask what is the meaning of the law, unless there is something on record saying what is the meaning of the law, the answer is nothing on record. If you ask if I apply for a job with the government, will I get it? There will be nothing in the records to have evaluated whether you should get a job or not. Therefore, there will be nothing on record. But if you made a job application and then say, what is the progress of my job application? That has to be on record. That has to be given to you. And information relating to any private body which can be accessed by a public authority. The law says all public authorities have to give information. What is a public authority? We'll come to in the next slide. Private bodies do not come under the ambit of the right to information. For example, cooperative housing societies are private bodies and they do not come under the ambit of the right to information. But information that can be accessed by the registrar of societies or information which is supplied by law to the Registrar of Societies, by Cooperative Housing Societies, can be accessed from the Registrar of Cooperative Societies. But when you are thinking of filing an RTI, remember one thing, you are asking for what is on record, what exists. Now, who has to give the information? The law defines public authority. Public authority means any authority or body or institution of self-government, established or constituted by or under the constitution, by any other law made by parliament, by any other law made by state legislature. A, B, and C effectively cover everything that we call government. Central government, state government, municipal corporations, panchayats, all of these are covered by A, B, and C. It also covers bodies created by act of parliament or state legislature. For example, the Sri Gurudwara Prabhupada Committee is one such body and there are many bodies that are specifically created by an act of parliament or state legislature. They are also public authorities and come under the ambit of the Right to Information Act. By notification issued or order made by the appropriate law, D says. An example of this is all deemed universities are created by notification issued by the appropriate law. 
Therefore, they are public authorities and are covered under the ambit of the RTI Act. And includes any. Apart from this, it also includes any body owned, controlled, or substantially financed. Non government organizations substantially financed directly or indirectly by funds provided by the appropriate government. I talked of cooperative societies in the earlier slide. If an administrator has been appointed for a registered cooperative society, then it is under, controlled by the government and therefore is a public authority while an administrator is appointed, owned and substantially financed. There's some controversy about PMKS fund on whether it's a public authority or not. And the government is saying it is not. I beg to defer the law categorically says controlled by government. The PMKS fund says we are not controlled by government. The chairman of the PMKS fund is the Prime Minister of India, ex officio. Three other trustees are ex officio trustees of the PMKS fund. All these four people act on behalf of the government. They are public servants first, and they cannot claim that we act privately and not on behalf of the government when holding a position ex officio. PMKS fund, in my opinion, should definitely come under the Right to Information Act. What does right to information mean? Right to information means the right to information accessible under this act, which is held by or under the control of any public authority and includes the right to inspection of work, document records, taking notes, extracts, or certified copies of documents or records. You can inspect files, you can inspect work. For example, if you believe a road is of very bad quality and has a lot of potholes, if you say under right to information, this has a lot of potholes, give me a how many are on record, the answer might be we don't have any record of any potholes on the road. Seek an inspection of the road with a government officer. You will walk down the road, take photographs, record the potholes, measure their sizes, etc. You create a government record in this sense. People have inspected hospitals, people have inspected other works, documents and records also. Taking notes, extracts, or certified copies of documents or records, this is what is normally done. Taking cert cop certified copies of documents, taking extracts from these, this is what 80-90% of the RTI information revolves around. Taking certified samples of material, you can also take certified samples of material. For example, if you believe the medicines in a government hospital are fake or of expired, consistency, you can take samples and get them tested. You can also take samples from food go down grains, food grain go downs and various other places. Obtaining information in the form of biscuits, floppies, tapes, video cassettes, or in any other electronic mode or through printouts where such information is stored in a computer or in any such device. CCTV footage is a very important source of information and increasingly will become an extremely important source and that is included in J4, 2J4. The most important section of the RTI Act I hold is Section 3, which is the shortest. Subject to the provisions of this Act, all citizens shall have the right to information. Who can have the right to information? All citizens of India. Can any information be denied? The philosophical base I said is you own the government, you own the nation, you own this government exists for you. You legitimize your representatives, a member of parliament, member of corporation, member of legislative assembly, gains legitimacy because you give him legitimacy. Otherwise, he's nobody. The moment he loses an election, he becomes an ordinary person. They form governments which therefore then select people to become public servants and control them. All public servants also owe their legitimacy to the elected members who owe their legitimacy to the citizen. Therefore, all citizens shall have right to information. Can any information be refused is the issue, subject to the provisions of this act. Can anybody say this information is confidential, this information is sensitive, I do not want to give it. The answer is no, nobody has such a right. But there are exemptions carved out in the law 
there are exactly 10 exemptions, which are very small representative of the total information with government, which are exempt. Only subject to the provisions of this act can any information be denied. Otherwise, all the information, default mode, I repeat, is all information belongs to you and should be given to you. The heart of the RTI Act is Section 4. Unfortunately, it's very poorly implemented. Let's read one part of it. Every public authority shall maintain all its records duly cataloged and indexed in a manner and form which facilitates the right to information under this Act and ensure that all records that are appropriate to be computerized are within a reasonable time and subject to availability of resources computerized and connected through a network all over the country on different systems so that access to such records is facilitated. <coughs> it's been 17 years since the Act was passed. Enough time to have implemented this. And let me share with you a dream. All information should be accessible to citizens without having to file an RTI application. And what is possible with 81A? Computers are today everywhere, including in village panchayats. Most government offices use computers as electric typewriters rather than as a computer. Internet connectivity is also there in most village panchayats. In fact, most states have one person in each village panchayat who is specifically employed to operate the computer and the internet. Is a reasonable time? 17 years for that. A common experience that a citizen faces when he or she goes to a government office to follow up on an application or complaint or representation is finally military. सौ रुपये दिया तो फाइल मिल जाएगी, पांच सौ दिया तो रिकॉर्ड चेंज हो जाएगा, हजार रुपये दिया तो रिकॉर्ड बदली हो जाएगा। A few thousand rupees in the file can be made to disappear. All of this happens and leads to corruption and tremendous inefficiency. What could happen? Here's a dream I want to share with you. Think of paperless office. Work is done on a computer. An electronic file is created and shared or sent to wherever it has to go for approval. The efficiency would go up. 30% of India's corruption would disappear if this was done. This has not been implemented and therefore there is a great shortfall of information and a lot of people have to file RTI applications. There are 17 specific points mentioned in the section 41B. This is the heart of the RTI Act. Unsatisfactory implementation, computerization. Proper implementation would improve working efficiency. It would also make the PR's job easier. Over 50% of RT applications seek information which should be available under Section 4. This has been done through a study done by Raj. Very well, we have understood what is information, what is right to information. Who do I go and ask it for information? The law says, Every administrative unit of a public public authority must appoint a public information officer. Usually, he's not specifically doing this job. He's also doing an additional job. And this is an additional responsibility given to him. He must be there in all administrative units. of Where should I seek information? Think logically. Where you expect the information is likely to be. Expect. You don't have to be 100% sure, but reasonably think of it and file a RT application to the public information officer at that address of the address of the public authority. Can they refuse it saying we will this doesn't belong to us? The answer is no. No RTI application can be refused to the sovereign of this nation. If the information is not with that officer, he must obtain it from the other officers in his own department and provide it to you. Supposing it is with a completely different department, you have filed an RT application with, let's say, the Mitsubishi Corporation, but the actual information is with the police or with the PWD, then what happens? Can they give it back and say, go ahead, file it there? I repeat, the answer is still no. The law requires that the P 
PIO must, public information officer must within five days transfer the RT application to the right department and inform you accordingly. This truly recognizes the sovereignty of the individual. There is a small fee of 10 rupees usually with the RT application in most states. Different states have different structures in terms of fees and formats. When you get a form, the acts does not specify any form. Some states may have a format. Any plain piece of paper is your form. A person who desires to information obtain any information under this act shall make a request in writing or through electronic means in English or Hindi or in the official language of the area in which the application is being made. So you can apply in any of the three languages, English, Hindi, or the official language of the state in which you are. However, you cannot insist that the response must be in the language of your choice. The response is likely to be in the language being used by the office. An applicant making requests for information shall not be required to give any reason for requesting the information or any other personal details except those that may be necessary for contacting him. The only thing that you need to give is your address. If you wish, you can give your phone number or email ID. But that is your wish. B, nobody can ask you to give any reason for requesting the information. This, some people say, is not a very rational thing to do. Think of it logically. If you own something, can you be asked to give reasons for using it or for opening that or taking a look at it? The answer is no. Nobody can ask you to do that. Therefore, because you are the owner of the information, you need not give any reasons for requesting the information at all. On receipt of a request under Section 6, PIO shall as expeditiously as possible in any case within 30 days of the receipt of the request. Either provide the information on payment of such fee as may be prescribed or reject the request for any of the reasons specified in Sections 8 and 9. Most states have got a fee of two rupees per page. So the way it should ideally work is you send an RT application, PIO should send you a letter saying the information that you are seeking is, let's say, 150 pages. So at the rate of two rupees per page, please pay 300 rupees. After you pay 300 rupees, the information will be given to you. And this period of 30 days, how it will be calculated, we'll see in the letter slide. Can any information be refused? Reject the request for any of the reasons specified in Section 8 and 9. Only Section 9 deals with copyright if what you are seeking. For example, if you seek the DVD of a movie from the censor board, that would be denied to you since it would infringe on somebody's copyright, which is Section 9. 8 1 has exactly 10 sections, which we'll look at a little detail in the subsequent presentation. If PIO fails to give decision on the request for information within the period specified under subsection 1, PIO shall be deemed to have refused the request. And this means refuse the request without any reasons, which invite the penal provisions of the law, which we'll deal with. PIO must give details of further fees, as I told you, the two rupees per page, and how the 30-day period has to be calculated, we'll see in the next slide. Person making requests for information shall be provided the information free of charge where a public authority fails to comply with the time limit specified in subsection 1, which is 30 days. If within 30 days the information is not given to you, even if the information is 1,000 pages, the PIO cannot charge you 2,000 rupees and the information has to be provided free of cost to you. 30-day period, I thought I'll explain. PIO receives the RTI application this day one. After X days, PIO sends letter asking additional fees 30 day clock stops. Supposing the information is 150 pages, PI is not expected to photocopy and keep it ready. He sends you a letter saying, please pay 300 rupees. Until you pay the 300 rupees, he need not keep the information ready. Additional fees paid, 30 day clock starts again. Information sent after Y days, X plus Y less than or equal to 30 days. If RT application is transferred, they get 35 days, five days for transferring the RT application. I've given, uh, what should an RT application look like? What is the information you're seeking? A, avoid questions. Think in terms of what records are likely to be there. 
and seek the information. What is on record? A good IT application is generally brief, doesn't give any backgrounders, not necessary. You are exercising your right as owner of the information and the sovereign of this nation. Make it brief. Do not taunt government officers because the person who's dealing with it does is a human being like you and me. He doesn't like being taunted. Keep it bare facts and you can think of what objective you want to achieve or what information you want. Put it down plainly, as brief as possible. The briefer, the better results are obtained. I've given some examples of information seeking which would give you some idea. You can request a copy of this PPT from Money Life and then we'll be happy to share it with you. If you want to inspect a file, I've given a format which you could consider using. I want to inspect files relating to so-and-so subject or so-and-so file numbers. I will bring Mr. So-and-so to assist me in the inspection if you want to take somebody along. Please suggest two dates of the time at which I could come for the inspection. I will identify the documents for which I want photocopies at the time of inspection. Please ensure that the pages of the files are numbered. Uh, let's go back to the constitutional importance of the right to information. RTI is a fundamental right of citizens under Article 19.1a. It guarantees freedom of speech and expression. Various Supreme Court judgments have held that this includes right to information and right to publish. Pause for a while. Some people say right to information is a misuse. Right to information is too excessive. People blackmail, etc., etc. This is equivalent to right to publish. If the right to publish is a fundamental right in Article 19.1a, so is right to information, so is freedom of speech. Media has not been given any special place in the Constitution of India. It derives its legitimacy from Article 19.1a. And what is the logic of right to publish being a fundamental right? That is because it is the media, media is the medium through which the citizen gets information. Your right to information is the reason why media is important. Otherwise, it has no other importance. So if your right to information is the basis of media's right to publish, I think it's obvious that your right to information cannot be lower than the media's right to publish. Media's right to information right to publish and freedom of right to speak are all at the same plane and must be treated like that. Now, can any restrictions be put on this right? It's my fundamental right. Restrictions have to be put in the constitution of the country. Without that, if there was no other clause restricting anything, Article 19 1A would be limitless. There would be no restriction that can be put. However, Article 19 2, specifies some permissible restrictions. The only permissible restrictions are given in Article 19.2, which permits reasonable restrictions in the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of India, the security of the state, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, decency or morality, or in relation to contempt of court, defamation or incitement to an offense. These have been captured in Section 8.1 of the RTI Act. There are a few more additional points also, but they have the constitutional base in Article 19.2. And if there is any controversy about interpretation in Article 8, in Section 8.1 of the RTI Act, I submit it should be tested on the grounds of Article 19.2 of the for Constitution of India. Exemptions from disclosure. This is exactly 380 words. Understand this carefully and you understood what can be derived. All the rest belongs to you and should be given to you. This is very limited in scope. Notwithstanding anything contained in this act, there shall be no obligation to give any citizen. A, information disclosure of which would prejudicially affect the sovereignty and integrity of India, the security, strategic, scientific, or economic interests of the state, relation with foreign state, or lead to incitement of an offense. 81A is a fairly broad spectrum exemption. 
and the PIO must specify which interest would be heard. To explain the relevance of this, for example, Indian Army is a public authority as defined in the RTI Act. Therefore, it comes under the ambit of RTI in response to RTI applications. If you were to ask for the troop formations on the Kashmir border with Pakistan, that would be right to you because of 818. If something would lead to incitement of an offense, that would be denied to you. But apart from that, 81A has limited scope and most information that citizens seek would not fall under 81A. 81B, information which has been expressly forbidden to be published by any court of law or tribunal or the disclosure of which may constitute contempt of court. Please note very carefully, subjudice is not given as a ground for rejection. Information which has been expressly forbidden to be published by any court of law. Quite often, PIOs deny information saying the matter is subjudice. Parliament knew the word subjudice, but did not exempt subjudice matters. It said expressly forbidden to be published by any court of law or tribunal. When a PIO claims such an exemption, he or she must give you the specific order of a court or tribunal saying that this information cannot be disclosed. Without that, Information denial on the basis of subjudice is illegal. C. Information the disclosure of which would cause a breach of privilege of parliament or state legislature. What kind of information is this? For example, before the budget is announced, you cannot seek information on the budget papers. That would be breach of privilege of parliament or state legislature. Similarly, commissions of inquiry are set up by governments whenever something problem occurs. Quite often if the Commission of Inquiry report is unfavorable and the government does not want to pursue that, it puts it under the cupboard and forgets all about it. Other committee, other building scam, many of you would be aware of, it's a building in Mumbai on which a major scam had occurred. The government then appointed a commission of inquiry, which went into this and after two years supplied a report, which named some politicians and some senior bureaucrats as being responsible for the scam. Government did not like the report, therefore they put it under the table and did not present it anywhere. I asked for the other committee report under RTI after seven months. The Commission of Inquiry Act says it must be placed on the floor of the House of the State Legislature in six months. Once they did not place it for seven months, I saw the report. They refused to give it. I argued that you had already breached the privilege of State Legislature by not presenting it to the State Legislature in six months. After six months, all Commission of Inquiry reports are accessible to citizens under the RTI Act. The information including commercial confidence, trade secrets, or intellectual property, the disclosure of which would harm the competent position of a third party, unless the competent authority is satisfied that the larger public interest warrants disclosure of such information. This larger public interest override we'll deal with later. Let's look at the first part. Information including commercial confidence, trade secrets, or intellectual property, the disclosure of which would harm the competent position of a third party. For example, if you sought the formulation of Coca Cola, it would be derived to use based on this. But two conditions have to be satisfied. It should be of a nature of commercial confidence or trade secret, which means it is information that is not normally publicized or published. And somebody's competitive position must be heard. For example, a tender before it is awarded, information regarding a tender can be denied. After the tender is awarded, it cannot be denied. All agreements with government of private parties should be open to public unless they can show that somebody's competitive interest will be heard. Unless both conditions are satisfied, the exemption does not apply. 820. Information available to a person is fiduciary relationship. What is fiduciary? In my experience, I have seen that. Most government servants do not know fiduciaries. Most citizens are also not clear about what is a fiduciary relationship. And therefore, quite often when a 
public servant does not want to give information. He says, we hold it in fiduciary relationship. It's, and the average citizen says, oh, this must be something special. It's in trust. People trust government. Let me make a clear statement. 99% or more of the information held by the government is not held in a fiduciary relationship at all. What are the characteristics of fiduciary relationship? Someone gives information to a someone with superior knowledge for his or her benefit. Most information is given to the government, not for your benefit. It is given because there's a regulation, there's a requirement, there's a statutory requirement. B, you have a choice of whom to give it to. In the case of government, in most cases, you don't have a choice. C, that person is not permitted to share this information with others, but you are permitted to share the advice received with 100 people, if you like. The traditional standard fiduciary relationships are doctor-patient, lawyer, client, banker, customer, and so on, trustee, trust, etc. And all of these, these characteristics are found. And yes, you trust that person, therefore you go to him. In most cases, information held by the government is given not because you trust the government, whether you trust it or not, you have to give it because of the statutory requirement, because you want a job, because you need it. You have no choice in the matter. You can't choose who to give it to. You have to give it to the particular government agency required. I therefore repeat, 99% of the information held by government is not held in fiduciary relationship. And the Supreme Court in December 2015 specifically said that the government PIOs often use the term fiduciary to terrorize citizens. That's the word used by the Supreme Court of India. Information received in confidence from foreign government. Note carefully, this is the only place where the word confidence or confidentiality comes in. If information is received from a foreign government and the PIO claims it is given in confidence, there's no further argument. You have to accept it. And it is understandable because otherwise foreign relations would not be maintained. Information, the disclosure of which would endanger the life or physical safety of any person or identify the source of information or assistance given in confidence or law enforcement or security purposes. If disclosing of some information would endanger somebody's life or physical safety, then such information could be refused. But the possibility must be reasonable, not remote or just imagined. Information which would impede the process of investigation or apprehension of prosecutor or offenders. What kind of information is this? While an information, while an investigation is going on, can information be refused? The answer is no. Parliament did not say ongoing investigation information shall not be given. Parliament used the word impede the process of investigation. 70% or 80% of such rejections are done when somebody, a citizen has filed a complaint or a representation or an application, he finds nothing happening. So he says, I want the progress of the investigation. And most PIOs refuse to give information, claiming 81H, saying this would impede the process of investigation. It's laughable. A person who's given a complaint is unlikely to impede the process of investigation, and the information must be provided. 81I. Cabinet papers, including records of deliberations of the councils of ministers, secretaries, and other officers. Provided that the decisions of councils of ministers, the reasons thereof, and the material on the basis of which the decisions were taken shall be made public after the decision has been taken and the matter is complete or over. This is a unique exemption. Until a certain point in time, the information is exempt until a decision is taken by the cabinet. Once the decision is taken, it is incumbent on the government to make public after the basis on which the decisions were taken to give a concrete example. It had come before me as a commissioner also. My period as a commissioner was from 2008 to 2012. So everything that I've talked to relates to that period or period earlier to that. The then government had submitted a 
Nuclear Safety Regulatory Act before the parliament. And somebody had asked for the cabinet note and the basis on which this decision was taken. We have a refused saying 8-1-I. I ruled that until the decision was taken, which was to put the to put the law to put the law before the parliament, the matter was exempt. Once the bill was presented before parliament, no exemption could be claimed. In fact, the law required the basis to be shared publicly. The whole concept of democracy is that it's not just MPs and MLAs who discuss laws being made. Citizens must get an opportunity of weighing the pros and cons of this. Without that, there is no democracy. And this 8-1-I shows that very clearly. I wish laws were, when they were put in parliament or assembly, all the reasoning was laid out before citizens and citizens were to discuss the pros and cons of this. That would be true part of participatory democracy. 8-1-J, this is the most popular exemption which is grossly misused and grossly misinterpreted, but let's understand this. Information which relates to personal information, the disclosure of which has no relationship to any public activity or interest, or which would cause unwarranted invasion of the privacy of the individual. The public information, uh, the larger public interest clause, we'll forget just now, provided that the information which cannot be denied to parliament or state legislature shall not be denied to any person. What is personal information? Anything relating to a person. Your name is personal, your age is personal. If you write a letter or you issue a note, that is personal related to a natural person. Parliament did not intend to ex exempt all information which could be called personal information. It said if it is personal, Etc. just doesn't qualify under it. Besides, the disclosure has no relationship to any public activity. Somebody told me, he said, does it mean what I eat in my house has to be displayed? The answer is no. This confusion was assumed by Parliament. It was felt that a PI would be confused, adjudicatory authorities would be confused. What is privacy is not very clearly defined anywhere, including the Puttaswamy judgment. It, in fact, says it will develop on a case-to-case -case basis. Therefore, an asset test was given for the PIO, which is very easy to implement. Provided that the information which cannot be denied to the Parliament or state legislature shall not be denied to any person. Anyone who claims exemption under Section 81J must make a declaration that, in my opinion, I would not give this information to Parliament or State Legislature. If I go back to Article 19.2, the only two words in Article 19.2 which relate to privacy, decency or morality. Anything that violates decency or morality should not be given to Parliament, should not be given to any citizen. Notwithstanding anything in the Official Secrets Act, nor any of the exemptions permissible in accordance with Subsection 1, Public authority may allow access to information that public interest in disclosure outweighs the harm to the protected interests. Larger public interest needs to be shown provided it is exempt. If information is not exempt from A1A to J, there is no need to show public interest. To exercise the fundamental right, you don't need to show public interest. However, the law makes an exception and says even if information is exempt. If you can show a larger public interest, this is a very difficult and critical balancing act. And very rare decisions are there 
which concede that an exemption applies and there's a larger public interest. I'll give you a rough example of something like this. Supposing you sought from Punjab National Bank details of accounts of Nira Modi, it would be right and rightfully so saying it's held in a financial jurisdiction. So you may argue that there's a major scam that has occurred and therefore there's a larger public interest in disclosure. This kind of thing is what is involved. But normally do not back on the public interest override because first you don't need to be if you concede an exemption, this is a very difficult balancing act to balance. Now, here I explained what I said earlier in, about A1J. Provided that the information which cannot be denied to the parliament or state legislature shall not be denied to any person. The PIO must, PIO, First Appellate Authority, Commissioner, or Judge, whoever denies, who accepts exemption under 81J must say, in my opinion, I would not, I would deny this information to Parliament or State Legislature. I have again explained this because as I told you, from what I've observed, 81J has become very rampant and people have completely, grossly amended the act in a de facto manner and are now trying to make it de jure. The law does not give this exemption. This is an exemption which people must fight against. Incidentally, this gets support from R. Raj Gopal's judgment in Supreme Court in 1994, which says once a matter becomes a matter of public record, the right to privacy no longer subsists and it becomes a legitimate summit for comment by press and media amongst others. We are however of the opinion that in the interest of decency, Article 92, an exception must be carved out to this rule, which is a female who is a victim of a sexual assault, kidnap, abduction, or like offense, should not further be subjected to the indignity of her name and the incident being publicized in press media. If disclosure of some personal information will violate decency or morality, it should not be given to parliament, it should not be given to any citizen. That's the only kind of information which should represent less than 1% of the total information in the government. Section 11 applies to a third party. This also is often used. The Act did not intend 11.1 to be an exemption. It's a procedure. The PR intends to disclose any information or record or part thereof on a request made under this Act, which relates to or has been supplied by a third party and has been treated as confidential by that third party. PR shall, within five days from the receipt of the request, Give a written notice to such third party on the request of the fact that the PIO intends to disclose the information or report and invite the third party to make a submission in writing or orally regarding whether the information should be disclosed. And such submission of the third party should be kept in view while taking a decision about disclosure of information. This is being put in following the principles of natural justice. The assumption was that the PIO will think of harm that may come to the public authority to which he belongs. But he may not be equally careful about the harm that might befall a third party. Therefore, when a PIO intends to disclose any information or record, when can he intend to disclose? When he believes information exists and B, he believes information is not exempt. If he believes it is exempt, he must give a rejection saying, I believe this information is exempt. He gives a third party an opportunity to give the objections, justifying that an exemption applies. On such a submission, the PIO may think again and change his earlier stand and say, yes, oh, I did not realize this exemption applies. And such submission shall be kept in view while taking a decision about disclosure of information basically based on the provisions of 8.1. Rejection can only be based on section 8.1 or 9, not on 11. First appeal to first appellate authority within 30 days for not getting information, incomplete information or wrong information. First appellate authority is an officer senior in rank to the public information officer in the same department. This gives an opportunity to review the decision if it is wrong. First appellate authority should decide in 30 days. He can take another 15 days and extend it to 45 days. If a result of first appeal not satisfactory, find second appeal to the commission within 90 days. 
Section 19.5 says, onus on PI on the denial of information was justified. You do not have to justify any reason why you want the information. Unless you concede that an exemption applies, and an exemption applies, then of course you want to justify at the base of larger public interest. Carefully look at the response and see if information has been provided. Information can be denied only if it is not available, it is exempt under section 8 or 9, or file not found. Section 20 is the teeth of the act. This is the reason the act works to whatever extent it does. If information denied without reasonable cause, commission must penalize the PIO, deem PIO at rupees 250 per day or daily after giving the opportunity of explaining. Maximum penalty rupees 25,000. Commission can also recommend disciplinary action against the officer and compensation to be paid to the applicant. This recognizes the sovereignty of the individual citizen, not citizens in a mass. If Akbar Bacha or Shivani Maharaj ask something from their courtier and the courtier said, I will not respond, they will probably put them in prison. Here, the individual citizen asks for information which belongs to him. And if without any reasonable reason, it is delayed or not given, 250 rupees per day of delay with a cap of 25,000 is the penalty to be paid by a public servant from his or her own salary. The first time we have such a provision, which and it's a provision that is being enforced, not as much as it should be, but this is the teeth of the act, it gives the commission the power. Section 22 is also very important. Most legal issues get entangled. For example, somebody will say the Banking Act says this, Somebody says the RBI says this, somebody says the company law says this, and there's confusion about it. Which law will get supremacy? Here, Section 22 clarifies this. The provisions of this act shall have effect notwithstanding anything consistent there with contained in the Official Secrets Act and any other law for the time being enforced or in any instrument having effect by virtue of any law other than this act. As far as seeking information is concerned, the RTI Act overrides all other laws. Therefore, if there is a inconsistent provision in any other law or rule, the RTI Act should be supreme. There are some orders that do not follow the law, but that is, in my opinion, an illegal order. If another law or rule is consistent with the RTI Act, then there should be no problem of giving the information in RTI or through another route. It is a citizen's choice to decide which route to take. And if it is inconsistent, Section 22 categorically says RTI Act should do it. Putting it in brief, RTI application information in 30 days. If no response provided or unsatisfactory response, first appeal to be filed within 30 days of response or 60 days in case of no response. First appellate authority order after hearing within 45 days. If unsatisfactory order or no response, second appeal to commissioner within 90 days of first appellate authority's order or 120 days from the date of first appeal if no order received from the first appellate authority. As I said, any plain piece of paper is your form. You can handwrite it or generate it through a computer or type submit a, a typewritten application. Some states have specified formats. Maharashtra, for example, has a format. Central government has no format. Each state will have a different thing, either a format or no format. Generally, there's an application fee, which is 10 rupees to be submitted. And in most cases, in a postal order, which is available at post offices, can be submitted as a fee or cash can be submitted in the department itself. Now, here's a fairly famous story. One young boy of Vidarbha from a small village who had passed up to seventh standard came to Mumbai looking for a job to improve his prospects and to see that he could earn enough to feed his family. Where did he stay? He stayed in a slum with an uncle of his. 
and he was going around looking for a job, looking for contacts. Somebody would employ him and use through a contact, etc. He heard there was an RTA workshop in the Basti. So he went and attended that workshop. He understood that right to information is his fundamental right, that he is the sovereign of this nation and therefore owns everything that the government owns. Understood that information is what exists on records. It is not a questioning process. It's not a right to investigation. It's a right to information. And information is what is on record. And understood all this, he moved on. He got a job somewhere and then he needed a ration card. So he went to the rationing office, gave his application. As he was going out of the door, the queue accosted him and said, Aapko ration card chahiye kya? He said, Haan bhai, isi bhi forum bhare. The pune said, Chai pani dagiya. This boy said, Thik hai, main aapko chai pila dunga. The pune said, Chai pila ne ki baat nahi hai. You'll have to give 2,000 rupees, only then will you get your ration card. This boy, without batting an eyelid, said, I will not give a bribe. My ghost name is Dota. The Pune Shrug, he said, stupid chap coming from a village doesn't understand how things work in cities. So, go, you will ration card. This boy went back. He asked others in the Basti, people were paying bribes and getting their ration card in about 40, 45 days. He waited three months and then he filed this RTA application. I'd given an application for a ration card on 5th August 2006. Photocopy of receipt and dash. I want the following information about its progress in the following format. Date on which, which would trace who took what decision and to bed in the file go. I want a list of ration cards issued in the last two months, giving the dates on which the applications were made and the dates on which the ration cards were issued. Now, what could they say? If they were to respond to these, the record existed, what would they say? The file, your application has not moved at all since Japan in India. They couldn't say that. Or they would have to say the file has not moved at all, which would expose wrongdoing. And the second query also would expose this. He did not ask why have I not got to Russia card. He asked for records or what was on record. The next day, the you came to his house and said, Sabne hai. He went to the rationing office. As soon as the officer saw him, he said, Are, are, he aaye hai, ke liye kursi le kya ho. Or, ration card le kya ho, or, ek cup cha, or, ek glass pani le kya ho. He did not give chai pani, he got chai pani instead. And then one cup of tea and one glass of water to me is respect for the individual sovereign citizen of this nation. That is what right to information is all about. It's not merely about getting information, monitoring your government, exposing corruption. All these are there. But most importantly, it is a citizen empowerment tool. People have used this kind of method for getting income tax refunds, for getting movement or complaints, applications, etc. But I must clearly point out, if the information was provided without giving the ration card, it could have been done technically. The RTI Act would have been satisfied. RTI is not a grievance redressal tool, but sometimes it is aiding grievance redressal. But more importantly, establishing the sovereignty of the individual citizen. Now, here's another one which I had fired myself. Now, this was before I became a commissioner. At that time, I was just an average citizen of Mumbai. Nobody knew me really. One fine day, on the Times of India, in the front page, I saw a photograph of citizens demonstrating at a public place in Mumbai because one police constable Bore had raped a minor. Legitimately. On the same day, on page 5, I saw a small news item which said, Police Inspector Prakash Avery of Mumbai Police had raped a minor the earlier year. The evidence was clear. He was suspended from service and the case was filed in court. Since they did not give enough evidence, the case was dismissed. And the news item said that Police Inspector Prakash Aure was being reinstated in service. When we reached such things, we feel angry. So did I. I felt anger. And I said, let me see if I can do something with RTI. 
So this is the RT application that I said. According to a news report, Police Inspector Prakash Avrio was accused of raping a minor girl in September 2005. He was acquitted by the session squad in February and has been reinstated in service. I want a photocopy of the order reinstating it along with the file notes based on which the decision was taken. I was only seeking records, trying to draw the attention of the government and to officers of how immoral and how ridiculous this position was. The PRU denied the information, in my opinion, illegally. So I filed a first appeal, grounds for appeal, facts of the case. I asked for information regarding the reinstatement of Inspector Prakash Avare as per the attached application. The PIO first sent me a letter saying that information will be provided by Baikala Police Station. PIO Baikala replied by his letter of 16 5 2006 that the information could not be provided as it was exempt under Section 8183, which exempts information which would impede the process of investigation or apprehension or prosecution of offenders. Grounds for appeal. PIO has not shown how providing the information could impede any investigation. In fact, no investigation is being held since Prakash Avare has been reinstated. The rejection is without any basis in law. I've just given you a rough idea of how. So you should argue based on the law, not saying I like this or this is in public interest, which is the flaw that a lot of people do. Fight it on the exemption not being applied. And the reason of telling you this story is to see how powerful it can be used. And there are very good government officers. We need to support them. Most of us don't support anything. And we just say that it was the first appellate authority. They usually call you for a first appellate hearing. So he said, Mr. Gandhi, what could we do? The court has released him. Hum kya kar I said, sir, from my perspective, there are two possibilities. A, Prakash Chavre is guilty of the crime he's supposed to have committed. Reinstating him would be a great disservice to the police force, to society and the nation. B. Prakash Avare was innocent of the crime. Somebody framed him. Some action should be taken against someone. You can't just say that nothing happened and relax over it. The Deputy Commissioner of Police saw my point. And he said, Mr. Gandhi, let me see what I can do. In 20 days, I got it in writing from the Police Commissioner of Mumbai. The police inspector Prakash Avare had been dismissed from service. That is the power of right to information that any one citizen, any one citizen, I was just an average citizen of Mumbai, can achieve. There are very good government officers who need to be supported. RTI is one tool to support honest officers to draw attention to wrongdoing and to get our governance to become better. Summary. Central government has no specified format for application. First appeal is useful to use Maharashtra format. Application fee, 10 rupees. IT applications can be made online also now in some cases. Central government, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, and Delhi have got websites. You can go online and get that. What is it so difficult? A survey of mine shows that most citizens of India grip for two to three hours every month about what is wrong with India. Roads are bad, people are corrupt, government doesn't work, governance doesn't work, political classes, criminals, so on and so forth. Does that cribbing change anything? Can it change anything? The answer is no. It can change nothing. Then why do we do it? Maybe it's good for our mental and physical health. My suggestion to you is continue cribbing for half the time. The other half the time, spend on thinking what are the solutions possible? And how can we pursue them? How can we be a productive? You are the Bacha or Begum of this nation. It is your responsibility. It is nobody else's responsibility. If we don't make the effort as lazy citizens, Governance will not improve, government will not improve. 
You can keep blaming people, nothing will change. You can do various things. If nothing else, on something that you are cribbing, consider making one RTI application once a month. My own observation is that 10 to 15% of the RTI applications lead to some improvements, maybe small. Sometimes, of course, big improvements come in like I was lucky in the Prakash Avri case. It may not happen every time. It may not happen to you. It will happen to somebody. Let us build adequate pressure by filing RT applications. We are ensuring that we are establishing the sovereignty of the Indian citizen, the Bhatsha and Begum that you are and you should believe in. If you make the effort, nothing will stop you. At one such lecture, there was a gentleman my age. People my age have very firm things. Most of you are younger than me and smarter than me. So this gentleman got up and said, Mr. Gandhi, this is not happening. This is to talk India can't do anything in India. I've done a lot of complaints, I've done a lot of RTI applications, I've done a lot of work. Each one of us individually may or may not succeed. Don't worry about it. Collectively, collectively meaning not necessarily coming together. Each one sitting in their own house, in their own office, in their own town, city, village can make the difference by filing RT applications to highlight something, draw out corruption, to just know, to keep a watch and monitoring on the government. If 50 lakh Indian citizens take a vow to do this once a month, every month, six crore RT applications a year, one crore times we could make some impact, some small change in the governance structure, some improvement. In five years' time, you'd be a better nation, better government. But how do you answer this friend who says, Kuch nahi hota hai. To them I say, many of us go to mandirs, masjids, gurdwaras, churches, agyaris, derasas, what do you have? Once a day, once a week, once a month, maybe once a year. When we go there and come out, do we get an extra 100 rupee note in our wallet? We don't. Do we feel we become younger, more powerful, energetic? Nothing like that happens. Why do we do it? We do it nation. This is an act of faith for the nation. If we make a move, things will change. Yeah, nobody else. Before I end, I'd like to share a small slogan of mine. Mera Bharat Mahan, we say, lots of places we write this, but you don't really believe it, do we? Therefore, I say, Mera Bharat Mahan nahi hai. Mera Bharat Mahan nahi hai, par ye dosh mera hai. I, the individual sovereign citizen of information of India, am responsible. Mai is desh ka bachcha ya begam ho, aur meri zimbabari hai ki desh ko great banana. Thank you, friends. Start believing you are the bachchas and begams of this nation. And I am sure we will have a better nation, a greater nation. Thank you so much for the presentation, sir. Uh, I think we'll take questions from the audience now. Uh, if you have a question, please use the raise hands buttons on Zoom uh, and I'll unmute you to, so that you can ask your question. Uh, in the meantime, there's a question in the chat. Uh, someone has asked how, how they can file a complaint against a central information commissioner for an erroneous order. For all practical purposes, you'd be whistling in the wind. Technically, I can tell you, you can write to the president, you can write to the governor, you can write to the Supreme Court. Effectively, nothing will happen. You'll just be wasting your time. Instead of which, file one or two RT applications is my submission. Right. Uh, me too, Diwan. I'm unmuting you. You can uh, ask your question. Hello? Me too. I have just asked you to unmute. Uh, 
Hi, good evening to everybody. I would like to know uh, from Salesh sir that if the CPIO is not responding or providing the misleading information, at that time can the applicant uh, give a notice under section 176 of the IPC uh, regarding the violation of the administrative rule of the uh, government of India. So in that case, I have pointed out some IPC sections like 167, 191, 202, 203, 217, 218. So all these sections are relating to uh, framing the wrong uh, writing on the letter uh, in the ATI reply. It can be challenged before the High Court and Supreme Court also. Um, violation of the uh, administrative policy of the government rules. Can it be possible, sir? I am no expert on the law outside RTI. But what I understand is that even filing an FIR where an actual serious crime has been committed is a fairly difficult exercise to get there. Some people have managed to do it, but I don't know if they've led to any real change or improvement or results. I'm slightly skeptical about it, but I'm not saying don't do it or do it. I repeat, I am no expert on the law in general, except for IT information. Uh, we'll take the next question from Commodore uh, Lokesh Patra. I'm unmuting you. Hello, Commodore Patra. We can't hear you. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to unmute my view. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Here I have one question to Shaleji. If the fit, this is related to fiduciary relation, that is 81E, and the other is privacy, that is privacy information, 81J. Here is a condition where the public authority says he is in fiduciary relation and it's a personal information of XYZ. But the XYZ, by virtue of law of the land, has to put in the public domain information of that and coming straight to the point. Take a case of SBI, which is selling the electronic bonds, electoral bonds, sorry. Now we have asked for number of political parties which have registered themselves to be eligible for uh, encashing the electoral bond the, and the name. Number they have provided, the latest one was 24. When it comes to the name, they mention it 81E and 81J. My point is that each political party is required to, in their auditory report, give the details of uh, info, the mode of donation, which they give it electoral bonds. Till now, 19 now party names are known, which is part of my argument. Regarding personal information, party name cannot be a personal information. Isn't it? So that I is you, what you I have argued it. My appeal is pending with the SBI. No, no, it, 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 81J just cannot apply. A bank cannot have personal name. information. You don't say a state bank of India has personally done something like this. No, it's a name that of Congress. Absurd. Let's say Congress, BJP, any name of party cannot be because all party which are listed are in, on this ECI website. They, they are not an individual person at all. So this is exactly what is fiduciary. It cannot be because the Parties have to put on the in the public domain in the ECI website after auditory report. So far, we have the 19 names. So this is the appeal I am working on. Similarly, in the case of GOVIN for PMK, initially the PIO had said under section 11, second, they provided me letters and everything, and they said they stand by that it has been given to Prime Minister's office. They don't say PMK. When the case came to CIC, CIC is not happy. He said, you are not given a decision finally of Section 11, but gave some hint of using J. Now, here again, Prime Minister office cannot come under Section 81J. Am I right? Absolutely. Now, the matter has to go to court, high court, PMK, because they are in a wrong. This is CIC. I mean, a backdoor suggestion to the PIO. You give a fresh report and say J. What is Prime Minister office said? Prime Minister care fund does not come under the RTI, but Prime Minister Office says so. Prime Minister Office, it so that we were oh, stuck. 
in, in my opinion, the PMK is fund itself is a public authority. Absolutely. It's controlled by government. Yeah. To that make know, that the prime minister and three ministers operate privately, though. Sir, that is that is a question we are separate. Which we in my presentation categorically bring them under the eye, but somebody has to go to high court. Now here, I'm question is that J. I'm today's subject is J. Can the prime minister's office be placed under eight one J? The prime minister's office. I'm not talking of PMK. Mr. Matra, categorical zilch. No. no. That's the point. Then I have to look. Denial is illegal. Unconstitutional. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, I'm Karim Mullah. I'm unmuting you. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, my question is: uh, uh, I'm given uh, a judgment uh, by the SIC, State Information Commission. Right. Uh, what happened in the order? Uh, the concerned PIO gave misleading information, and based on misleading information, he passed a, a very absurd order, stating that information is uh, covers under eight one J, and it cannot be provided. So I brought the same info. I mean, uh, I in link with that, immediately after the order, I brought the connection that it is not covered under the eight one J. So uh, immediately, what happened? Along with the supporting document, I approached uh, again the SIC, the State Information Commission, by enclosing the copy, stating it is a misleading information, and it is coming under uh, Section Two Two H, that is the public authority. Now the order is already passed. He is saying he has got no ju 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 jurisdiction. So is there any provision for uh, review? No, uh, in my opinion, provision of review has to be specifically in the law. There is no provision for review in the law. Therefore, the only option is a writ before the High Court. Right. We'll move on to the next question. Mr. Sayak Sahu, I'm unmuting you. Right. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, Good evening, um, Mr. Gandhi. My, I'm afraid my question is a little more basic in nature. I haven't yet filed a single application for under RTI. Um, my question is this, that the fear of being targeted by any specific government department, how valid or how reasonable or how rational is that fear? I'm a 40 year old man who runs a very small business organization and that is something which plays in my mind. If you can kindly throw some light on that, thank you. Uh, I would not say it doesn't happen or cannot happen or will not happen. It does happen. And therefore, I tell everyone, judge your own safety limits. I That is to do with the overall rule of law in India. In terms of rule of law index, I don't know that you are aware, we stand 79th out of 139 countries, which is pretty poor. And we hope to make this a rule of law nation by slowly persuading people, but individual officers will still continue like this and I have no real solution for this. So I'd say you decide for yourself what risk you want to take or what risk you don't want to take. Uh, Mr. Narendra, I'm unmuting you. You can ask the next question. Yes. Uh, Mr. Gandhi, uh, thanks for the uh, information. Um, I have a question on what kind of information can be asked. So just to make it a little more specific, my question, um, uh, there is a public sector insurance company which has not been responding to various emails uh, for my annuity. Now, um, um, okay, the questions I want to ask is, please let me know why you have not responded, although I've sent the documents. No, 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 no. That, you see, there is, it's unlikely that you'll get a response because there'll be nothing on record saying why we are not responding. Okay. Ask for the progress of the letter itself. Okay. And if comments are made by anybody, etc. I got it. Follow the rationing card example. Yeah, yeah. So what is on record? 
think of what is on record right. and how you will you try and get that out to show that things are not okay sure i'll go to the next point questions i wanted to ask um i want to know what is their response time uh they um, acceptable or as per their uh, standard procedure what is the response time for emails uh, okay because i am not received a, a 99 99% there will be nothing on record like this i see okay the third... ask that ask that <laughs> say if there is a standard time or a maximum time as per your rules to respond and they 99% the answer will be we have no such standard okay the third question is that they have a list of phone numbers which uh, 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 supposedly are helplines um i have made uh, close to about 100 calls uh, not even once that uh, thing has been picked up so i want to know whether these uh, helplines uh, how many calls do they uh, take in a day sure, sure. It's, it's a query which is very legitimate okay uh, ask ask for maybe weekly or monthly statistic of how many calls are received by these helplines and responded to Uh, right so none of these will be dismissed as i mean as irrelevant and look look, look, look i i cannot guarantee that somebody will not act illegally i can tell you what the law tells you okay okay badmasho gutto ko kaise hang karna hai ye mere dust ki baat hai okay the fourth question and i will close after this um is what is the balance of funds which you have not paid out to uh, for annuity or uh, uh, retirees because uh, you claim you have not received the documents so that that would be tricky i think it would be difficult to get a response like that think of it some other way okay okay fine thank you uh, we'll take a couple more questions and close out for the night uh, ca rakesh gupta i'm unmuting you धन्यवाद सर राकेश गुप्ता दिल्ली से बोल रहा हूं सर नमस्कार राकेश जी अच्छा मेरी क्वेरी नहीं सजेशन मैं आपसे मांग रहा हूं मैंने सीआईसी में नॉन कंप्लाइंसी 2010 से पेंडिंग है काफी तो मैंने क्वेरी की सभी आरटीआई जो डिप्टी रजिस्ट्रार है उन्होंने रिप्लाई किया कि रिप्लाई में तीन पॉइंट मेन है पहला रिप्लाई है कि हम सभी केसेस की हियरिंग नहीं करते हैं नॉन कंप्लाइंसी की बेसिकली रूल बारह का वो करते हैं वॉयलेशन कि अप्रोचिटी प्रोवाइड करनी है अपीलेंट को अपीलेंट को विदाउट अप्रोचिटी प्रोवाइड किए वो केसेस डिसाइड करते हैं ये सभी डिप्टी रजिस्ट्रार ने बोला है कि ये जो डायरेक्शन है हमें कमिश्नर ने दी है ये राइटिंग में सभी ने बोला है नंबर टू सीआईसी में फर्स्ट कम फर्स्ट सर्व का रूल है पर जो नॉन कंप्लाइंसी पेंडिंग है वो दो से पेंडिंग है तीसरा भी इसी से रिलेटेड है पीआईओ नॉन कंप्लाइंसिस में लिखता है कि मैंने ये कंप्लाइंसिस नहीं किए ये ये कंप्लीट कर दी हैं उसके बाद भी सीआईसी कहता है कंप्लाई हो गया और अप्लीकेंट कहता है मुझे आपने अप्रोचिटी नहीं दी है मेरे बैक पे आपने केस डिसाइड किया है आपका रूल कहता है कि मुझे अप्रोचिटी प्रोवाइड करो तो आपने बेसिक अपना सीआईसी का रूल तोड़ा है आर का रूल तोड़ा है सीआईसी का नहीं आर का रूल तोड़ा है तो जब पीआईओ भी कह रहे मैंने इन्फॉर्मेशन नहीं दी तो जो ऑर्डर है रिवाइज करो तो इसके बेसिस पे मैं हाई कोर्ट में जाना चाह रहा हूं और कमिश्नर को कोर्ट्स यानी आप कोशिश कर लीजिए कोर्ट्स आर नॉट वेरी फेवरेबली इंक्लाइन टूवर्ड्स राइट ये आप तय कीजिए मेरे हिसाब से आपका पॉइंट लॉजिकल है legally you are right but whether the court will give you relief or not i am not too sure but think think about it we'll take two more questions and we'll close out for the night uh, shah ji mk i am sure. unmuting you well, thank you very much for your time and guidance <clears throat> sir actually i had uh, some seven doubts of which five i already placed on the chat so i don't repeat go with that and remaining two which i could not place in the chat i am just placing before you sir so <coughs> there are some sir I'll, i'll i'll stop you right there please don't ask seven questions we'll limit you to just one because no no sir seven five already placed five i am not repeating only two i am asking okay 
I already placed in the chat. You may kindly place before him later because okay. I cannot consume a lot of time. Uh, sir, uh, there are some uh, conflicting orders of CAC on some aspects. For example, Section 7 and denial. And there are conflicting orders by the CAC that one set of orders says that 7 and can be resorted to, to decline information. But whereas some other set of orders, they say that no, 7 and cannot be adopted as a measure for denying information. Similarly, the other thing is a website, proactive disclosure. In, in, my, like, in, my opinion, in my opinion, 7 9 cannot be used to deny. Denial of information can only be on 8 1 or 9. The act is very clear about it. Yes, yes sir. But yes, there are conflicting orders by CIC itself. Two sets yeah, of orders. I, I, I would only say that orders that say that 7 9 can be a ground for denial, to me, my mind, are not as per law. Similarly, sir, a website, place, the information placed on the website also. There are conflicting orders. Uh, in some orders, they say that because it has already been placed in the public domain, it is not anymore under the control of the public. Ask, ask, no, I, I understood what you are saying. This again is illegal in my opinion. Where does the law say it is? If it's in a, on the website, it can't be given. In fact, I've given decisions saying that if it is on the website, offer it to the applicant. But offer to supply the information in hard copy or soft copy or whichever way. It is. In my opinion, very clearly, this is illegal. Sir, the next issue is uh, regarding this uh, uh, when multiple avenues uh, are sir, there. Sir, sir, I, I, I think now we need to move yeah. to the summary. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll take the last question from uh, Nishant Thad. I'm unmuting you. Okay, and uh, with that, I think we'll close out for tonight. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending. We have another session coming up. Uh, in a fortnight's time on 21st uh, September. Uh, we'll be uh, talking again with Mr. Shalesh Gandhi. It is a session where we'll discuss uh, how you can tackle uh, illegal transactions under the RTI Act. So if you want to attend a session, you can send us a mail at foundation at moneylife.in. You can also drop us a mail if you want a copy of the PPT and uh, we'll send it across to you. A recording of this session is, I think, available directly after the session ends, it will be available on our YouTube channel. And you can always uh, send us a mail if you need any other information. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, thank you, Gandhi, sir, for uh, taking the time. And, Thanks. And my salute to the Bachar and Begum of India. Yes. Goodbye. Thank you. Good night.